to be as like centered as possible, but I really can't tell. So I'm just gonna hope for the best. Hi, my name's Olivia. It is, um, oh my god, where is my script? <laughs> okay, so today I'm gonna be trying something that I have never done, but I've seen many people do, and that is true crime. I watch it religiously, like it's all I watch. <laughs> Literally, I was like, oh well, why crochet today? I can just watch true crime. Forgetting that I'm supposed to be the one doing it today. So, um, I'm gonna try to do that and I will be, again, crocheting. True crime and crochet is like two things that I absolutely love with all my heart. I crochet all the time as well as watch true crime and I honestly just crochet while I watch true crime and listen to it and I have such a passion for it that I was like, I kind of like really want to do it myself because you know when you're listening to it you just imagine yourself telling it or that's how I feel at least. So I thought I would combine the two things that I love to do and try and make it as a little bit of an entertainment. But yes, I am very excited and I am ready to get into it. So today we are going to be talking about Nathan Dunlap, which can also be known as the Chuck E. Cheese murders. It is something that I've had a very, very big interest in for a couple years now, this one specific case. And I have researched if many people have done videos on it or anything, and I really could find any videos on it, like whatsoever. So you can imagine covering this case was extremely difficult but i did a lot of deep diving and i found it so fun to research on my own terms for my own video but yes that is the case we're gonna be doing today and i hope y'all are ready for it so nathan dunlop was originally born as nathan gerard rochelle and he was named this until he was adopted and that's when his last name changed to dunlop and Nathan was born on April 8th, 1974, and this was making him an Aries. And Nathan was raised by his biological mother, Carol Dunlop Nee Jones, and his adoptive father, Garnet Charles Jr. Now, Carol and Garnet actually did end up getting married only a few months after Nathan was born, but they never told Nathan that this was not his biological father until he was 15 years old. There was not much research on how Nathan handled this news. It really just said that they told him. I cannot imagine that this was good for his mental health as if I found out my mother was my adoptive mother <laughs> two years ago, I probably would be very upset just because of the fact that they had been lying to me for 15 years. Um, not so much that you can't have an adoptive parent and them feel like your own. It's just the fact that they were lying for so long to him. I can't imagine that he handled it well. So the family actually did move around quite a bit until Nathan was a little bit older. They moved around to Michigan, Illinois, Tennessee, and then they moved to Colorado, which is where they decided to stay. And that is where the events of today's case do take place. And Nathan did actually have two siblings. He had an older sister named Adenia and a younger brother named Garland. Garland does not take much presence in this case. It's more of Adenia as being an older role model and does go through a little bit more of his childhood with him. And I do think very very highly of Adenia. I just reading about her gave me so much admiration for her and respect. I'm really excited for you all to hear just how brave she is. So Nathan growing up did actually have to do with his mother who was diagnosed with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and then his adoptive father was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia as well. Carol Dunlap actually did call this the Jones curse because schizophrenia had run in the family for generations. Carol's two half-sisters, her nieces, and her paternal grandmother all have schizophrenia as well. Carol did have many, many, many bad schizophrenic episodes, and this did lead her to many hospitalizations between 1972 and 1974. And these schizophrenic episodes did terrify Nathan as well. He was not comfortable with them, and he did not know how to react to them. So Carol actually did have such a bad episode that in 1972, she did have to be hospitalized for the next six months after having her first child and her first daughter, Adenia. And Adenia did actually have to be in a foster home for the next three years. Adenia would go on to say that she was very confused and she did not understand what was going on. And Carol did have Adenia with her first husband who was named Rufus Rochelle. So while Carol was in and out of the hospital, she did actually end up having an affair with a man named Jerome Ling, and he did actually get her pregnant and ended up leaving her, and Nathan never met this man. This is Nathan's father, 
and this is the man that she slept with and then ended up leaving her. This is when Nathan comes into the timeline and when he is born, but he never meets his father because he does end up leaving the family. So while in this time frame, Nathan did actually have to go join his sister in the foster homes due to the fact that Carol was still having such bad episodes, she would still get to visit them every now and then and take them on walks for a short period of time. But while taking them, the caretakers did notice that Carol would berate her children and physically harm them for no reason as they were said to be very well behaved kids and they had done nothing to her to deserve that kind of treatment. They were both very terrified of her. Now, while Nathan was a toddler, he was still put back in the care of Carol, and she was still having her manic episodes. They were said to terrorize the children. She would still physically harm them. She would stop eating. She would stop sleeping. She would even wake the children up in the middle of the night to have them move furniture around. She was said to even have become hyper-religious, and she even joined a cult. Carol was also seen as hypersexual. She did touch both sons inappropriately. One time, Jerry did walk in on Carol touching Nathan's penis inappropriately, and she did this on several occasions. And at one point, she did try to kill herself and Garland, the youngest son, because she did believe that he was possessed by the devil. And then in this period of time, the family actually did move from Chicago to Memphis in 1976. And they actually did end up staying there for quite a bit of time. And in 1984, they moved from Michigan to Colorado. And Carol's husband at the time, Garnet Charles, was actually reported to have 14 different wives and 21 children in total with them all combined. This man was a little whore. And Garnet Charles did sexually and physically abuse Carol. So in 1987, Carol was officially diagnosed with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Before this, there was no diagnosis. She was just having many manic episodes and was seen as severely mentally ill. But she did get this diagnosis when Nathan was 13 years old and she was treated with lithium, which severely helped her manic episodes. And Nathan was left to take care of her in this time, which was a little scary for him because he was the most terrified of her out of all three children. But now Nathan is 14 and he has tried committing suicide while in high school two separate times and his father did bring him to a doctor and he was told he was fine okay so he was told he was fine while still showing signs of hypomania and during this time nathan did begin to act out and be committed several armed robberies so Nathan's record actually does start here when he is 14 years old. He hit a dry cleaners and a hair salon with armed robberies and golf clubs, and he did spend time in juvenile prison for this. So while Nathan was actually in this juvenile prison, he was having some episodes and he was then sent to a mental facility and he was then diagnosed with having some thought disorders. But Carol did pull him out of this because she was afraid that the family secrets would come out and these family secrets were really just Carol's sexual abuse that she didn't want anyone finding out about. And now I'm actually going to read a quote from a caseworker that had worked with Nathan before. I worked in the public welfare system for 17 years and Nathan's case is the one I think about to this day. I especially think about his family and how they helped make Nathan who he is today. I understand he made choices that caused him much pain for many people and what he did was inexcusable. But even when he tried to make good choices and get his life on the right track, his parents threw obstacles. His mother in particular raised him with lies, deception, and distortions of reality and abuse. I watched even as Nathan went into placement, how his family continued to destroy his life in some respect and made things worse. It's really sad to see that even when Nathan tried to get better, his family just stomped on him and pushed him into the ground even more. And it really shows how much your upbringing can make a difference in the outcome of your life. And even after getting pulled out of this mental facility, he then went back to selling drugs and then was caught again and sent back to juvenile prison. So at this point, Nathan is just a revolving door into the juvenile prison. And it's just really sad to see because he was so young, but yet was making so many mistakes and he just didn't have the support of his family there. And while also dealing with their mother's manic episodes, Adenia and Nathan still had to suffer physical abuse at the hands of Jerome. Adenia and Nathan would receive beatings with fists, wooden rods, and belts. They would receive beatings for the smallest things like leaving their dishes in the sink or taking donuts from a hotel they were staying at. Adenia was quoted saying her home was a living hell. 
And Jerry Dunlap was a professional football player, so he did weigh over 200 pounds and was violently beating Nathan on a daily basis. He was most violent towards Nathan, and the siblings now believe that is because Carol talked about Nathan's biological father to Jerry, and many believed that Jerry would get very jealous and blame Nathan for this, and he also blamed Nathan for his mother's mental health. Garland being Jerry's biological son, he did endure some abuse, but it was severely less than both of the other children. Some of the abuse that Nathan would endure was being hurled down the hallways, thrown down the stairs, hit with objects, and then being punched by Jerry. And Carol would go on to say that she did not know this abuse was happening. She said that she would hear things in the middle of the night and think it was just the family members moving furniture around the house. Okay. And Jerry was actually sexually abusing Adenia from a very young age for almost a decade. It started when Adenia was nine years old and then eventually escalated into full-on intercourse when she was 12. And Nathan did actually walk in on this happening one time when he was 15 and Adenia was 17. I can only imagine how traumatizing that must have been for Nathan. I can't even imagine what that must have felt like to walk in on your sibling getting sexually abused by your adoptive father and you can't do anything about it knowing that this man can take you down in a fight. And the abuse was known to get worse after this because Jerry did think that Nathan saw him raping Adenia and so he was going to hopefully beat him to keep him quiet. I feel like there's a special place in hell for this man. And throughout all of Nathan's childhood, he was showing signs of bipolar disorder and hypomania, but he was getting no treatment for this. As well as no treatment for this, Nathan was getting no coping skills, and this was huge in the family, very hereditary, and it was almost bound that one of these three children were going to get it. And leading to this murder, nothing really changed. Everything in Nathan's life stayed the same up until he was 19. He still suffered the same abuse, the same very physical and mental abuse from both parents and he was still struggling with hypomania and bipolar disorder. So now we're going to be jumping forward to 1993 where Nathan is 19 and this is the year that his case does take place. And Nathan's symptoms of bipolar disorder do significantly jump up here at 19, which does make sense because bipolar disorder doesn't significantly show until you were 20 years old, and that is normally when you get a diagnosis. So this makes a lot of sense as to why he was struggling very, very strongly just months before the murder. So several months before the murder, Nathan started to look very unkept. He was not brushing his hair, he wasn't eating, sleeping, taking care of himself. And Nathan never really cared about his appearance, but it became very crazy to where other people can start noticing that he is not doing well. And Nathan did start to have this alternate reality inside his head. Instead of this crazy looking guy who was mentally struggling, he was this cool, chill dude who was carrying a gun around. And Nathan was doing a lot of small armed robberies, but then this very much escalated in December of 1993. So Nathan does get a job at Chuck E. Cheese just a couple months before the murder, and he gets this job just to make a little bit extra cash and to just have something to do. But Nathan is ultimately fired just about five to six months after starting his job there. And Nathan was fired due to attitude problems because he felt he was not getting the hours he deserved. He did not leave on a good note. It was a very, very bad note when Nathan left Chuck E. Jesus. I just can't help but think about my job and how many people have left on a bad note. And I know this is, I don't know, I'm scared. Like, what if they come back? If they start coming back, I'm gonna be a little bit, you know, you know. So at this point, I am now going to introduce the victims of today's case before I actually start talking about what happened. So the first victim that we are talking about is Bobby Stevens. He did actually pick up this as a second job just to help with Christmas as it was just right around the corner. He wanted to make a little extra cash and help out around the home. And Bobby had actually only been there for two weeks. And the next victim is Sylvia Kathleen Crowell. She was 19 years old and a college student. She had been working at Chuck E. Cheese for about full time for about two months. And this is a quote from her brother, Daryl Crowell. My friends were always trying to flirt with her. She was really friendly and did stuff for everyone. She thought of everyone else before she thought of herself. And Sylvia did graduate high school in 1993 and she was known as a very pleasant student and everyone really enjoyed being around her. And her teacher, Kathy Albrecht, I'm not sure I'm saying that last name right, said that she was someone that any of her friends could go to and they would know she would listen to them. 
and it was said that having a smile and being encouraging was just natural to Sylvia. And Sylvia did live at her parents' house during this incident, and many people did come to visit her home whenever this incident happened. The next victim is Benjamin Grant, and he was 17 years old, and he was a high school student. Benjamin was a junior at Smoky Hill High, and he was a member of the wrestling team. He was described as a good student and a friend to everybody by his classmate. And Benjamin had only been working at Chuck E. Cheese's for a couple of weeks. The next victim is Colleen O'Connor, who was 17 years old and was a senior ready to graduate in May. She went to Eagle Crest High and strived to have the best grades ever while working at Chuck E. Cheese's and having eight classes. One of her classes did send her to an elementary school where she got to work with kids. And after Colleen had made a recent decision to become a vegetarian, she had wrote that she knew it was always wrong to eat dead animals. Part where my camera cut out and it did cut me off, but just only by a few short sentences. So all really that needs to be added is that Colleen O'Connor was described as fun, likable, popular, and that she always had a story to tell and that she was doing very, very well in school. It was handling working a job and doing school at the same time very well. Okay, I'm sorry for the lighting change and it's a little bit different. My phone is now not using any more storage. Great. The next victim was Margaret E. Kohlberg, and she was 50 years old at the time. Margaret E. Kohlberg was a manager at the store, and she decided to move to Colorado from California with her husband in September, and she had been working at Chuck E. Cheese's since November. Margaret did have two daughters with her husband of 17 years. And Mel, Margaret's husband, did actually say that they moved away from California to get away from violence, and it's really sad to just know that they didn't really achieve what they were setting out to do. And this is a quote from Margaret's husband, Mel. We wanted to come back to a simple life. We made it four years out there and we couldn't make it four months out here. There's some irony in there. The couple enjoyed doing aerobic fitness. They were very into physical activity. Margaret specifically enjoyed walking and cycling and she even did cross country skiing. So now that we have gone over all the victims, I'm sadly now going to be going into the murder of today's case. So before they closed, Nathan actually came into Chuck E. Cheese's to get dinner, and then he went and played some shooting games, which is very telling of his character. He specifically played Hogan's Alley, and then he went in the bathroom and hid before they closed. It was getting pretty late on a Tuesday night in December of 1993. Margaret had actually been watching the clock very closely. It was her first night closing as a manager by herself and they just had a family birthday party that happened that night. So they were quite busy and they were just starting to leave now at 10 p.m. Margaret was now gathering all the receipts and she was gonna go into her office and tally them and then get ready to go home for the night. While Margaret was going to tally her receipts, Sylvia had actually begun cleaning the salad bar. She had just worked there earlier that day with her best friend, and they were her shouting I love you to each other, and those were the last words that Sylvia had ever said to her best friend. And Ben had actually started to vacuum, and he could not hear any of his surroundings, and Colleen had actually just gotten a call from her parents saying they had bought her a new car, and she was just a little bit distracted. And Bobby Stevens was in the kitchen. He was actually not scheduled to work that day, but he had wanted a little bit extra cash, which is just so scary to think about if he had never come in that day and how different his life would be. Now, while they're all cleaning and getting ready to close, Nathan is still in the bathroom hiding out and he is psyching himself up as he has become quite nervous for what he is about to do. He looks at himself in the mirror and tells himself he can do it and then grabs a gun and proceeds to leave the bathroom. So Sylvia Crowell was actually Nathan's first victim and while she was cleaning the salad bar, she did not hear Nathan come up behind her at all. Nathan had a 25 caliber semi-automatic pistol and he did raise this to Sylvia's left ear and pulled the trigger. And Nathan did turn away at this point because he couldn't handle the sight of blood and gore. So after killing Sylvia, Nathan then moved on to Ben and Ben was vacuuming so he could not hear Nathan at all. Nathan shot Ben once and Ben died before he even hit the floor. And I cannot imagine how scary that must have been. You have no warning, nothing. You're just dead within a few seconds. So then as Nathan finishes killing Ben and Sylvia, he then moves on to Colleen and Colleen did know he was coming. Um, it was not said how she knew. I'm assuming she either heard the bullets or heard all the ruckus and just knew that something was going on. So Colleen does actually begin to plead for her life saying, don't shoot, I won't tell. And Nathan looks at her and says, I have to and proceeds to shoot her killing his third victim. So Bobby was actually coming back from his smoking break when he heard all the ruckus, but he did not think too much of it and just went back to go do the dishes. 
So at this point, Bobby is washing dishes and he can hear the gunshots, but he does think that they are popping the balloons from the birthday party. Then Nathan barges into the kitchen with a jacket on, some gloves with holes where you can see his knuckles, and he is wearing a backwards baseball cap. Bobby started to say hello until he realized what was going on, and then Bobby proceeds to say, oh shit. Nathan then proceeds to smile and raise the gun and shoots it at Bobby. Bobby then falls to the floor, and then Nathan proceeds to move on to his next victim, Margaret. So Nathan proceeds to hold up the gun to Margaret and tells her to open the safe. She does so immediately and gives him what he asked for. The last words that Margaret did hear were thank you before he shot her in the ear, killing her. So then Nathan does grab the game tokens and the receipts and he grabs a bag of $1,500 and he proceeds to shoot her twice, making sure that he killed her. Nathan then proceeds to leave the crime scene where he just leaves all the dead bodies and blood and everything and he goes to his friend's house where he starts bragging about killing his employees execution style and then starts showing them all the trinkets that he got like this was some kind of show and begins to just brag about everything. At this point, what Nathan did not know was Bobby actually wasn't dead. Nathan did not kill him with his shot. So Bobby decided to play dead for a little bit, which I think was the smartest thing he could do. Uh, I can't imagine how panicked he must have been in that situation, but he still had enough sense to know what to do. So he played dead and after Nathan left, he ran up and used all his energy to go to someone's house and he called 911 from there. Bobby actually does pass out while getting help, and I feel like that is so reasonable. He's probably used all his strength just enough to stay awake and get help. Um, I feel like he is just so strong for what he did. But while this is all happening, I can imagine it's very chaotic for all the victims and Bobby and the families. But Nathan is actually at his girlfriend's house having sex with her. Nathan gets a call from his mother saying that the police are at his house looking for him and Nathan doesn't really seem concerned at all. He proceeds to just then get in the shower and scrub himself as best as he can trying to get rid of any gunpowder residue and any physical evidence that might still be there and then he proceeds to stash the cash away. At this point, Nathan is then brought in for an interrogation and he sticks to the story that he just went in for dinner, um, had a quick dinner, left, and then heard about the shooting from the news and at this point um, after Nathan's interrogation the police did believe that he was guilty but all the victims were either unconscious or dead in the hospital so they really were just going off their intuition and Bobby's phone call which they couldn't really use at the moment so they had to let Nathan go. So eventually Nathan's girlfriend did actually end up confessing that he came to her house with a bundle of cash and blood and he was then taken into custody after this. December 23rd, nine days after the murder, Nathan was actually charged with four counts of first degree murder, four counts of felony murder, and burglary, assault, aggravated robbery, and theft. So at this time when Nathan was going to go on trial, there was a huge disarray in the state of Colorado over gun violence and really just any teenage drugs and violence going on. So Nathan's case really skyrocketed, taking place right in the perfect time of all this disarray. Nathan was almost 100% guilty. There was no question about that. Really, in his trial going forward, was just deciding if whether or not he should get the death penalty. And the DA at the time, knowing how much disarray was going on in Colorado, was fighting for the death penalty before the trial even started. So again, with this trial being so big and such a huge case for Colorado, death penalty was really the only thing in question. Nathan's innocence was never an, really an option here. His trial was decided really beforehand. So before the trial, Nathan was found guilty of all charges. And so his team decided that he would do a plea bargain and just plead for a life sentence instead of the death penalty. So this plea bargain was actually denied and he was forced to go to trial and it did take the jury three and a half hours to decide that Nathan was guilty. While the family was having the initial hearing about their past loved ones and talking about the death penalty, Nathan was really struggling here and just lashed out at all the family members. He would explode and yell at them saying just awful things. And I can only imagine how much this did not help his situation, but he truly had no control over his emotions in this moment. Now, before his trial, there was brought up of question if Nathan was even fit to stand trial. He really was having a lot of erratic episodes and he was even known to have spread feces across his cell and even himself at one point. Nathan was then put on suicide watch. 
Adenia actually had visited Nathan in jail during his trial at the time and has said that his eyes were glassy, he seemed crazy and unintelligible. Adenia has said that it reminded her of her mother's episodes, which I can only imagine how much heartbreaking that would have been to not only know the fate of kind of how your mother turned out, but now you're seeing your brother, your sibling, someone who you grew up with turning out the same way. Many psychologists were brought in to see if he was fit enough to stand trial, to see if he was acting like his mother, and if all the symptoms were still there, or to see if he was faking it. However, the psychologist did decide that Nathan was fit to stand trial. The defense did believe that this was biased and that Nathan was having a panic attack during the shooting, but there was nothing they could really do about it besides give their defense. During this time, Colorado had had their first execution in the past three decades, and Nathan did find out about this, and he was even being taunted by the guards, saying he would be next. Nathan then went into a very big spiral and had a manic episode and then had to be hospitalized. I never think that Nathan is right. He is completely wrong, but however the guards taunting him and saying that he is going to be next is not going to help anything when he is clearly very mentally ill. At this point, Nathan did actually get a new set of lawyers and their primary goal was to say that Nathan did not get a fair trial, that it was decided before it even began, and that if the jury knew about all his mental issues, that they would not have made the decision they did. However, if he did get this retrial, the death penalty would not be an option, he would just get a life sentence. Nathan's case then brought into debate about how mentally unfit you had to be to stand trial. There was no evidence that Nathan was committing this crime due to the fact that he was bipolar. George Brocker was now the new DA in office and he had set a new execution date of August in 2013. Then as a last resort, Nathan has then asked for a clemency appeal or a pardon. He then says that his trial was not fair and he's not mentally stable. He was not then mentally represented correctly in his trial and he says that the state of Colorado has racially motivated sending him to a life sentence or even the death penalty. And at this time, there are only three men on death row and they were all black. But while in office, a black woman of color DA has said that it had nothing to do with their race or their color, but only cold blooded murder. And I can help but agree with her here. I am all for sending up for rights and everything, but in this situation, just because there are three black men, you all committed a murder. That has nothing to do with your race in the situation. And I feel like it was kind of low for Nathan to bring that up. Um, he is a murderer. He's going to try everything he can to get off of this death penalty. And I would love supporting him, but I feel like this is a very low thing to do. And if you all committed a murder, there's a reason why you're all there. You're not all there for no reason. There's evidence. And the DSA's response to this was kind of that they already gave him a second chance and his mental issues were represented in the trial. So there was a new governor elected at this point and his name was John Hickenlooper and he does decide to give a reprieve at this time. He then decides to say that as long as he is governor, Nathan Dunlap will not be executed for his murder and this is basically saying that as long as he is governor, nothing will happen to Nathan. And the whole state of Colorado really saw this as just a very long time out for Nathan rather than a yes or no answer that they had been looking for for many years. And the last time a reprieve was done was in the 1900s. The point of having a temporary reprieve rather than clemency is really out of of respect to all the, the jurors and judges, the prosecutors and defense attorneys, the expert witnesses, uh, the, the respect to the, the rule of law in the state of Colorado, we're not, we're not overturning that. But I recognize as, as governor, uh, I could not find the justice in making that decision. Hickenlooper was then re-elected in 2014 and nothing has happened to Nathan Dunlap since then. 2020, then, when the state did decide to reappeal Nathan's case, he was then sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of no parole. So on the Colorado Sun on March 5th, 2020, then decided that all three men on death row were not going to be executed, but instead live the rest of their life in prison without the possibility of parole. They described this as one of the most emotional and draining decisions they had made. Now Nathan Dunlap is currently one of the only three inmates in Colorado serving death row. So before ending this case, I would like to go over Bobby's life since he is the only survivor and he does have a lot to say on his life after being shot. Bobby does say that Nathan does still haunt him to this day and I find that to be a very, very tragic thing and something that he can't help. 
Bobby does say that although he had surgery and turned out to be okay, he said that mentally he will never be the same. Bobby then says that he was one time going to a mall and he couldn't help but look at everybody's hands looking for a gun, feeling like someone was about to shoot him. Now Bobby does jump and get slight PTSD whenever a loud pop happens, so he then moved to Arizona to get away from it all for just a little bit. And Bobby even says that he was recognized at one point and he did hit the lowest point in his life and he said that he did try to take his own life. And Bobby says that he did step foot into a Chuck E. Cheese's one time after the incident and that was for his nephew's birthday and he thought he would be fine but then he did have a panic attack and it was a very severe issue for him. He said that the trigger was somebody started vacuuming and he said it just all came back to him. Bobby is then quoted saying this Every time I seem to move on with my life, I move past everything. It's in the back of my mind because you can never really truly forget, but you can place it aside and not have it affect you, he said. But it seems like every time I do so, something happens and it gets stirred back up. Bobby was for the death penalty. He was very outspoken about his opinion and he really wanted Nathan to be sentenced to death, but he now says that he's just gonna have to respect other people's opinions and understand that not everybody feels the same. I explain, you know, I've remained quiet. For, for this long, I haven't said anything, but now it's time for me to speak up. I think Nathan deserves to face his maker. He says he's just now glad the trial is over and he can move on with his life. So this is what I have so far, and I'm actually going to go finish this later because my brother just came home from work and I can't stay up here any longer. So I'm going to finish this and come back and show y'all. I'm very excited. It's turning out pretty cute. First off, I do think that Nathan is 100% guilty. I think he does have severe, severe, severe mental issues and he has struggled with that all his life. And I do think that if he was raised different, this would not have happened. If his parents had not abused him physically, sexually, everything they did to him actually supported him and helped him, this would not have happened. And I feel like I'm so passionate about this. Um, he, he wouldn't, this could not have happened. So many lives could have been saved if it just were for these parents, I feel like. I feel like maybe he would have done something like a little bit severe, maybe done some armed robbery still, but he tried to get help and he was improving or maybe if he was diagnosed sooner put on lithium something that could have helped this this he was a man he was not a boy he was 19 years old something that could have helped him and maybe these lives could have been saved you know there's no telling what could have happened but there's a severely higher chance that these people would not be dead if he was just raised the right way his case is something i'm very passionate about i find it very interesting i find it very different um you know he's got severe mental issues like what what made him snap you know why did he decide to kill these people all of a sudden after having 19 years of life you know i find it very sad that two of these people had kids at least bobby survived but margaret had two daughters and a husband she left behind and all these other people had mothers fathers everyone that loved and cared for them and he just took them away and now you know he's on death row and he will be serving his life which i think is well deserved but it's just sad that we can't get those lives back and no matter what we do we can sit there and appreciate them and talk about them all day long but nothing will ever bring them back i really do hope that nathan is doing better right now but part of me can't help but want him to go raw in hell for taking away these people's lives and i know he was severely mentally ill but it doesn't it's not an excuse you, you can't use that for everything um, he was still clearly fit to do trial, so in my opinion, he was fit enough to realize that what he was doing was wrong. Okay, I just got home from work, um, and I have been putting this off for a while, but this is the end result of what I was crocheting. I just thought I would show you all so you could see it. I think it's very cute. absolutely love it. It's a lot bigger than I thought it would be, so I don't know what I'm going to do with it, because I was going to put it in my car, and now I really can't do that. But yeah, I think it's really cute and I actually really love it. I think the mushroom is absolutely adorable. It really like pulled the look together. But yeah, that's what it looks like. Um, and I hope you think it's cute because I do. But yeah, I am very tired, but I like love talking about it and I hope you all really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it to the absolute most. Um, and I hope y'all enjoyed the video. Thank you so much and bye. Okay. Gerard Dunlap was born. Are you freaking kidding me? Are you freaking kidding me? Who's a door? What should like my outro be? But like, I want to think of something cute, you know? What if I'm like, oh my god, no. <laughs> Stop. Stop it right now. Okay, we'll find one another time. We'll figure it out. Okay. <laughs>